talk now is SEL4 core platform, security and performance without the complexity, with uh, Ivan Velichkovic and Lucy Parker. Both our speakers are engineers at the Trustworthy Systems Research Group at UNSW Sydney. Today, they'll speak about the SEL4 core platform, which builds upon the secure SEL4 microkernel. Please welcome our speakers. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, so like David said, I'm from the Trustworthy Systems Group. Um, we're based in UNSW at Sydney, and we're really trying to basically make reliable software. So the group does this, um, mainly focusing on operating systems and uh, combining that with formal methods to um, basically use mathematics to actually give software a higher level of assurance than anything else can. So before I talk about the SEL4 core platform specifically, I'm going to give a brief overview of what SEL4 actually is, um, for those that don't know. So uh, it's a microkernel, which is quite a radically different uh, philosophy compared to what you might be used to with something like Linux or FreeBSD or Darwin. Um, a microkernel aims for minimality. So what we're trying to do is push anything that doesn't actually need to be in kernel space out into user space. Um, and so this has some benefits, such as isolation, for example, um, which I'll, I'll touch on in a bit. Um, so some examples of this are things like device drivers, process management, and even memory management to an extent are all done in user space and not in the kernel. Um, so to illustrate this, um, here's a diagram of Linux where inside the kernel in this blue box, we have an IP stack, a bunch of drivers, various file systems, and say, one user program uh, that wants to use these. Whereas on SEL4, uh, or you know, microkernel, but SEL4 in particular, all of these uh, basically components would be separate processes. So if any one of these fails, uh, the whole system doesn't go down. And then so, in order for each of these uh, basically components to communicate to each other, they do that through the kernel. It is also a verified microkernel. So what that means is that the implementation of the kernel is formally proven to match um, a specification of its behavior. So this is done by having some abstract specification that then proves that the implementation in C actually matches that, and then the binary actually uh, is correct as well. Um, so you can don't necessarily have to actually trust your C compiler to emit the right bytecode. So the code is all open source, that's the kernel, and then the proofs are also available. And uh, in terms of organizing the whole ecosystem, that's done by the SEL4 Foundation, which you can find out more there. So what does SEL4 give us? Um, SEL4 attempts to give a high degree of freedom of policy. So by policy, I mean, uh, for example, uh, Linux will try to maybe load balance all the processes that are running, say maybe move a process to another core or something like that. SEL4 by design will not do anything like that unless it's explicitly told to. Um, so you can attempt to make your ideal policy at user space um, rather than the kernel making these kinds of decisions for you. Um, it's quite high performance relative to other microkernels. I don't think there's anything that uh, matches it. Um, so for example, if you heard of Fuchsia um, or the, the Zircon microkernel um, or Mark, or... it's also high assurance because of the uh, formal verification aspect of it that I mentioned before. Um, and lastly, it has a capability-based system. So. All of you will probably be familiar with something called file descriptors. When you try to open a file on Linux um, with the open system call, you'll get back a unique identifier that then you then pass to Linux whenever you want to actually do an operation on a file. This same kind of concept in SEL4 or a capability-based system applies to every resource. So this allows fine-grained access control, basically, because if you want to be able to do any operations on a specific, specific resource, you have to have the capability to it. Um, so for example, threads, uh, even the communication between threads, memory, 
interrupts and even to an extent how much CPU time a certain thread might spend uh, executing is also modeled by the capability system. So uh, what I've said largely sounds like good things. So why do we need the SEO 4 core platform? Um, well, building directly on SEO 4 has some trade-offs. The APIs are quite low level and general. So there's, for example, there's a bunch of you know, architecture specific uh, invocations or APIs that you'll have to uh, make and, um, even for basic systems. And so this adds complexity when you wanna actually use SEO4. But the benefit of this is that you can, depending on the application you're making, you can really design your abstractions to uh, be optimal for whatever you're trying to build. Whatever you're trying to build. So the benefit is that you can build abstractions yourself because of these low-level APIs, but the cost is obviously that you have to build the abstractions yourself. There's nothing in SEO4 that's just like, give me uh, a bunch of memory for a process or something like that. Um, that involves several steps. And this ultimately leads to a high barrier to entry um, in order to actually use SEO4 correctly or in the first place. Um, there's quite a lot of operating system specific knowledge just to get started. Um, and so to visualize this, I've got a diagram here or, or an image of all the kernel objects in a fairly um, non-trivial system. And you can see there's quite a lot involved to just getting a system up and running. Um, obviously you can automate this, um, but still there's, there's a lot going on. So to the aims of the core platform, well, it's a minimal operating system framework on top of SEO4. So it's supposed to um, first retain SEO4's security and performance. So if we're gonna abstract over the kernel, we don't want to uh, inherent or inherently limit anyone using the core platform itself. So we wanna retain SEO4's security and performance that it gives us. Um, and we wanna lower SEO4's barrier to entry. So we want to abstract over things like architecture-specific details and make it easy to start uh, processes or get memory and that kind of thing, which I'll talk about later. Um, and you know, practically, uh, this is done by providing an SDK with everything that you need, and then you use whatever build system you want with your application code, and ultimately, you get a bootable image that you then put on whatever board you're using, and then you can uh, load it up and run it. And so an example of this uh, was the Latte project um, done by a guy called Phil Maker, I believe, and uh, this was a experienced system developer, uh, programmer, who was not uh, experienced with SEO4 at all, and he was given the core platform uh, to try to make a system used in power stations uh, that does um, some kind of man-in-the-middle defense of uh, logging control variables and that kind of thing. Um, and it was relatively successful, so he was actually be able to, um, you know, obviously with some assistance, uh, make a system on top of SEO4 and leveraging its benefits while not having super detailed knowledge of the microkernel itself. Um, but one thing I want to stress is that the core platform is not supposed to be a general purpose OS. It has no intention of replacing something like Linux. Um, one of the main limitations of it, um, by design again, is that it has a static architecture. So this means that before you run uh, your you know, system, you have to lay out basically everything that you, that everything that's gonna exist. Um, so that, that'll be clearer later. Um, there is some limited dynamicism, and also touch on that in the next slide. Um, but yeah, so this is t targeted at embedded cyber physical devices like with the Latte project. Um, that's because it's targeted at these, that's how we can get away with these kind of, you know, fairly restrictive limitations. Um, because for these small embedded devices, having a static architecture is um, usually okay. So now I'm gonna talk about what actually, what abstractions does the framework provide us uh, in order to build systems on top of it. So uh, the closest thing that I guess I can uh, show that's uh, to a protection domain is a Unix process. So it's basically just an environment, a way of executing some code, right? If you have some program and you just want it to run, um, you would use a protection domain. Um, so here, uh, 
we have some library code that you basically call into, then that, that makes a system call to SEO4 and basically is a minimal abstraction of actually talking to SEO4. And then so all your user code is in the protection domain that just calls into the library. Um, this is much more lightweight um, than a Unix process. So because of the capability system, if we just had a protection domain by itself, by default, it doesn't have access to anything else. We have to explicitly give it access to, let's say, some memory or any other resources. Um, so this has three entry points. You'd expect like a main uh, entry point with a typical C program, but uh, on the core platform, each protection domain has initialization procedure. So this gets called when the system boots up to do any initting. A notified procedure and a protected procedure. These won't be clear until later, but these are basically to allow for communicating with other protection domains. And so for the uh, limited dynamicism right now, we have uh, just stopping and starting of these PDs at runtime, as well as loading them at runtime. But because it's a static architecture, obviously you'll have to still specify what um, protection domains will exist in the system um, at build time. So the next abstraction is memory regions. So obviously there's not gonna be any MMAP in SEO4. We need a way of allocating memory still. Memory regions are just a contiguous block of physical memory. So this could be used for something like regular memory if you wanted to have a shared buffer between some protection domains or device memories. Like I mentioned before, on SEO4, all of your device drivers are gonna be at user level, which means that um, you need a way of actually accessing the device registers and so on to implement. And so these may be mapped into one or more PDs. So like I said before, with a shared buffer and that enables zero copy communication because both protection domains will have access to the same memory. The next is communication channels. So if we have multiple PDs, uh, by default, they can't uh, actually talk to each other anyway because this is uh, part of the isolation guarantees of SEO4 unless we explicitly say so. So a communication channel, or CC, allows bidirectional communication between a pair of PDs. So this is for both synchronous and asynchronous communication. And a communication alone doesn't necessarily mean that the PDs trust each other. So now there's two ways of communicating. Um, the first way is via notifications. So say I have two protection domains here and they have a shared buffer. Uh, and let's say the green protection domain is a consumer of that buffer and the orange protection domain is a producer. And so it puts things into the buffer and then the green protection domain will then consume it and process it. And so the orange protection domain basically would put something in and then notify the other protection domain that something has happened. It's basically to indicate that some event has happened and we want to wake up the other protection domain, wake up its, its thread and let it execute. And so this is, uh, what this will do is invoke the notified procedure that I mentioned earlier. And then obviously there's an identifier given just so you can say, so you can know uh, which protection domain has invoked you or has notified you and you can handle that. And so this is asynchronous. So the orange PD, once it notifies, the green PD will continue executing and doing, um, do whatever else it needs to do. And so interrupts are also delivered as notifications for implementing device drivers. The next way um, of communicating is via something called protection procedure calls. So PPCs are uh, basically a way of uh, executing some other code in a different PD. So uh, let's say I have this gray PD and there's some kind of function that I want. Um, let's say the gray PD is a client and it's calling into some server that it wants and it wants it to do some operation. Um, and so this is a synchronous form of communication. The gray PD would call into the server, wait for the server to do its processing and then return back with some result. And so in this case, the caller must trust the call D um, because you're basically uh, executing the, 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 the callee is uh, executing basically on the caller's behalf. Um, you're trusting it to do the right operation when you call into it. 
And lastly, we have virtual machines. So if I wanted to run something like Linux on top of SEL4, um, I could use a virtual machine. So these are particularly useful for running software that you don't want to port to SEL4, which might be, uh, might be expensive in terms of time, uh, or it's just some legacy software that you don't want to touch. Um, you could run it still on top of SEL4, but just in a VM. And these are essentially a PD, just but with the ability to uh, run a guest OS and some other properties. It has the same properties as a PD, basically. Um, these are still experimental, so they're not in the mainline source code, um, but details will be finalized soon. And so I thought I'd illustrate all of this with just some example system. Um, so say I have uh, SEO4 and some uh, hardware device, and I don't want to write a driver on SEO4. I'd rather just use a driver that already exists in Linux. So I could have a VM that then uh, has access to that hardware device. I've told it it has access to that memory. And the virtual driver uh, can access that hardware device. And then if any client wants to send stuff to that driver, uh, it can do so. And that client could be either a native SEO4, uh, or, sorry, a, a protection domain, which is a native SEO4 thread. Or it could be another client in some other VM. Right? And so in this case, we have a transport layer that uh, allows communication between all of those, or facilitates communication between all of those various entities. So uh, I'd also like to touch on the verification story of the core platform. So we have a verified microkernel. This was done using something called interactive theorem proving. Um, but obviously, we want to be able to trust not just the kernel, but anything we use on top of the kernel as well. Um, and so this includes any code that the framework runs. Um, and so this is an ongoing research effort by some colleagues at Trustworthy Systems. But this is using different techniques to what the main SEO4 proofs were, uh, which is using SMT solvers basically to try to automate the theorem proving rather than doing it in a more kind of manual, interactive way. Um, and so one of the main goals is to verify the core platform runtime code. So the library that I mentioned before has about 200 lines of C code. And there's also something called a system initializer. So if I show you the basic uh, boot process, uh, of an SEL4 system. So we have the kernel that we can trust uh, it's, since it's verified, but we have the system initializer and the core platform library that we can't trust. It's running you know, code that we think is right, but we have no way of knowing that. And this is particularly important um, because the system initializer is what sets up all of those capabilities that I was talking about before, right? So if I know that some PD doesn't have access to this, uh, like a certain part of memory, I only know that because I trust that the initializer has set up the capabilities correctly. If it hasn't done that, then I could easily, some prediction domain could easily access some memory that it, that it shouldn't be, right? Um, and so verifying this initializer is uh, basically just um, leveraging an existing and already verified initializer, um, and that's currently in progress as well. Um, and then we have, uh, for these system initializers, we have a capability distribution language that basically needs to be, uh, that the system initializer consumes. Uh, and we need to make sure that the mapping from how we describe our core platform system to this more machine uh, readable capability distribution language is correct. Otherwise then, you know, I might describe some core platform system that then once it gets to the system initializer, the capabilities are all wrong. So to summarize everything I've been talking about, we can create systems using uh, a few uh, fairly simple abstractions. Um, so PDs for executing user level programs, memory regions for accessing device memory or shared buffers and so on, and channels for communication between protection domains and we, all, we specify all of these system resources, all of the protection domains, all the memory regions that exist, all the channels that exist at build time. And so by making these abstractions uh, in the framework, we can increase the usability of SEO4, since everyone won't have to do this process for themselves when they want to build a system. And so we also have a verification story in process, and you can 
all the code is open source, so you can have a look at it if you want. And so lastly, what's, what's next? Well, like I mentioned, we have the appropriate abstractions to build systems on top of SEO4, but there aren't any OS services like you would expect um, in something like Linux. So a major part of an OS that needs to be secure and reliable is device drivers. As you know, they're very fragile, and having them in the kernel can be disastrous. Um, and so we want to make sure that any of this particular service that an OS would provide is correct and can be trusted. And so for this, I'm going to hand over to Lucy, who's an undergraduate student at TS, and she'll be talking about the device driver framework. Thanks, Ivan. OK, so what is the SEL4 device driver framework? Well, as Ivan already mentioned, SEL4 as a microkernel prescribes device drivers to run as user-level programs. This has the advantage of reducing a driver's special privileges to just the ability to access the control registers of the device that it's actually driving. This not only significantly reduces the trusted computing base in the system, but it also provides strong fault containment to what's historically been very bug-prone code. Um, earlier research found that drivers on Linux have seven times the bug density when compared to the rest of the OS. Um, and I know a significant, um, the leading cause actually of Linux CVEs are because of buggy device drivers. However, the microkernel design has the potential to, of course, lead to performance degradation due to the inherent number of extra contexts which is required in such a design. So the device driver framework aims to rectify this by providing interfaces and protocols for writing performant yet secure device drivers on SEL4. So the SDDF is based on radical simplicity, where we prioritize a strong separation of concerns um, with multiple components, each running with a single job to do. So with that, a driver itself is purely responsible for hardware abstraction. For this, we assume a general device model um, that should enable formal reasoning with a simple implementation. And this is all based on top of an asynchronous zero copy transport layer that provides a means of communication to other components wishing to utilize the driver's services. It is still a work in progress, but currently supports a networking focused system, which is arguably the most performant critical system in the OS. And so tackling this is really the first step to developing high performant IoT slash cyber physical systems and it is all implemented on top of the core platform. So the driver model utilizes three distinct memory regions, or MRs. The driver will issue commands to the device's control registers, here labeled the metadata region, and the device will read and write data to a specified location for DMA. Now this data region can also be mapped into the server's address space, which enables a zero copy interface. The control region provides a means of communicating between a server utilizing the driver and the driver itself. So the server can issue transmit requests and receive information on newly received data, and then likewise in reverse for the driver. Now, in a networking-focused system, the driver doesn't actually need access to the data itself, so we can further reduce the trust we place in a device driver by avoiding mapping this data region into the driver's address space. So, like I said earlier, the driver is purely responsible for hardware abstraction. So it's translating a hardware-defined specific device protocol into a hardware-independent or OS-specific device class protocol. So with this, uh, we model it as single-threaded, and it simply just reacts to updates in either the control region or the metadata region. Um, and these updates come in the form of SEL4 notifications. Um, and of course, an interrupt, which is mapped onto an SEL4 notification. And we say that it's active in that it has um, the ability to execute, so it, it um, has the capability to access CPU time. So the transport layer, or control region, is comprised of lock-free bounded ring buffer queues. And these queues themselves are single producer, single consumer, which is a very intentional simplification. And we utilize two queues per direction. These queues simply keep track of addresses in that shared data region. Uh, so for example, on the transmit path, we have the transmit used queue, which keeps track of buffers with data that's ready to be transmitted. 
and then the transmit free queue, which keeps track of buffers that are free and ready to be reused. And the queues themselves are very simple. Like I said, we keep track of an address in the data region as well as the length of data that's there or potentially the capacity of the buffer. And then we use head and tail pointers to enqueue from and dequeue to. And then we get these really simple enqueue and dequeue functions uh, where we can maintain memory safety without the need for locks by utilizing a write memory barrier to ensure that no reads or writes are reordered by either the compiler or the processor before we update this head or tail pointer. So the buffers are continually, continuously reused. For example, on transmit, the server would grab the next available free buffer from the transmit free ring and then write data to the address specified. And then it would put that address into the transmit used queue. We would then notify the driver that we have data ready to be transmitted. The driver would wake up, dequeue from the transmit used queue, and then write that address to the uh, device registers to initiate transmit on the device. Sometime later, the device would then interrupt the driver, notifying that either the transmit was complete or potentially an error had happened. And the driver can get that address and put it back in the transmit free queue, ready to be reused again. So with all of this, here is some pseudocode for a very simple network driver. So like I said, it simply waits for an event and then dequeues and enqueues pointers as required. And this event could be a hardware event um, in the form of an interrupt, or it could be a request to transmit from the server. So what's important here is that we loop around dequeuing and enqueuing so that we can potentially process multiple packets in a single invocation. Um, and we also loop around reading and clearing the hardware event register. So this means that we can potentially process multiple hardware events in a single invocation. Of course, at low throughput, this is unlikely to be the case, but at high throughput with all this uh, looping, um, there's high chance that another hardware event has occurred and we can preempt any kind of kernel interrupt by reacting to it here early. We also combine the system calls on SEL4 whenever we can. Um, so this could be that we're signaling an update to the uh, server's control region, combine that with the next wait for event system call, or it could also be that we're acknowledging an, in acknowledging an interrupt. So on SEL4, the kernel actually masks the hardware events until it has received a notification from the user level interrupt handler that that interrupt has been dealt with. Um, and this acknowledgement is just a signal to the kernel. So we can combine this signal with the next wait for event system call and thus further reduce the number of system calls required in such a system. So this is all great for a single server application, but what about if we wanted to have multiple clients? So for that, we have a simple multiplexer whose sole concern is to share the NIC or share the hardware. We implemented the multiplexer at layer one. So the multiplexer simply has a mapping of a virtual MAC address to a client ID. Um, this could have been done, of course, at layer two or layer three, but then you'd be uh, confining clients to either a specific IP address or potentially a set of ports, um, and then you'd be confining them to a particular protocol. Um, but this wouldn't be a difficult change. We also separated out the receive and transmit paths, as there's no need for these to interact. And this means, of course, we can have separate policies on each path. So the only thing that really makes sense on the receive path is a FIFO, first in, first out policy. But on transmit, there's a few different options. So one of these would be round robin, so taking turns to process each client's request. But it could also be priority based uh, with one client who takes priority over another. And we could also limit clients' throughput as well. And rather than coming up with a generic policy that caters to all of these, um, we propose instead um, choosing a simple and specific policy for your use case. And these policies can also be swapped out at runtime, of course, should the need arise. So how does such a system look? Well, we have the driver with the shared ring buffers um, on either side, so one to the actual hardware, and then the 
other set would be connected to the transmit multiplexer and the receive multiplexer. And underneath this is the shared data region. These would then be connected straight to the clients uh, or potentially with a copy component in between. So this small copy component, um, that, that sole job is to copy the data from the shared data region into the client's own address space. So this ensures that clients don't have the ability to access each other's data. This isn't necessary on the transmit path um, as we can just map the transmit data for each client into the transmit multiplexer um, and then the hardware can deal with that directly. So in, if we were to expand out, um, the simplicity of the system means it's scalable and we can have each of these components running on separate cores in a multi-core system and exploit full parallelism of such a design. It might also look like we've added an extra copy to the design, um, but if you compare it to POSIX system, which copies, on, copies into user space and then back out again, we've actually reduced a copy operation. So in order to minimize round trip times, we run the driver followed by the transmit multiplexer at highest priority. So this ensures that as soon as packets are ready to be transmitted, the appropriate components will be invoked to transmit them. So although we're using asynchronous notifications to signal these updates, uh, the protocols are essentially synchronous. This is great, except the driver is reacting to receive events as well and it then has the potential to monopolize the CPU um, if the receive path has high throughput. So we can either limit the CPU time, uh, the access that the driver has to the CPU, or we can also limit the queue size. So this ensures that the queues will fill up in the, on the driver and then the driver will no longer have any work to do and this will ensure that components further down the line will have the opportunity to run. So how does it all perform? Well, we first initially evaluated a simple two-component setup, so with a server that is comprised of a simple IP stack and an echo client, um, and as well as a driver running as a separate protection domain. And then we used an IP bench program, which runs on separate machines to send UDP packets of a specified byte size to our target SEL4 machine, which echoes them back, and then IP Bench counts the number of successful replies to determine the throughput as well as the latency. And this load can be split across four separate machines so that we can achieve the desired load. We also ran an idle thread in the background to count the number of idle cycles so we could determine the CPU utilization of the system. And then we compared this to a typical Linux setup with an in-kernel IP stack and driver and a user space echo client. Both of these were running on single core. We, I also have some performance figures for the larger scale system where we have a transmit multiplexer, a receive multiplexer, this simple copy component, and again, the combined IP stack slash client. So here is the throughput mapped against the CPU utilization for both Linux and the two component SEL4 in green. So what you want to see is like a nice straight diagonal line. Um, the dotted line is the CPU utilization. So as you can see, SEL4 does achieve significantly more throughput. We actually get wire speed. Uh, it doesn't quite look like it because we're accounting for Ethernet headers here. Um, but Linux drops out at around 680 megabits per second. We do have higher CPU utilization, but I believe that we can get this down. Here is a comparison of the median round trip time um, from a sample size of 200,000 packets. So SEL4 starts nice and low around 100 um, milliseconds per packet, but this does increase as the system becomes increasingly overloaded. However, this is not to the same extent as Linux. As you can see, it's um, significantly more by about a factor of 10. And here is the performance comparison of the five component setup. So this is the receive multiplexer, transmit multiplexer, as well as the copy component against the two component, uh, which is now in yellow. So we achieve almost the same throughput and there's only about a 10% utilization increase, um, which is fairly insignificant when you think about how many extra system calls that 
are required in a larger setup. So overall, there's some significant takeaways we can get from this project. We achieve smaller latencies and higher throughput over Linux, and this ultimately shows that simple works and you don't necessarily need to pay for it with performance. The single-threaded, single-producer, single-consumer queues also eliminate a lot of concurrency bugs and will aid any future verification effort of the system. Our previous research categorized driver bugs into four separate categories. We had device protocol violations, OS protocol violations, concurrency errors, and then generic. Um, and the simplicity of the system eliminates almost 40% of such bugs. There's still a lot of work to do, um, including further analysis to improve performance. And we'd like to get that CPU utilization underneath Linux, ideally. Um, and this would involve benchmarking a more complicated client, um, something that's more evocative of an actual use case as opposed to Echo. So something like a web server or a web client where the traffic is not necessarily symmetrical on each side as well. We want to look further into the IP stack we're using. We used LWIP, lightweight IP stack, just out of the box. Uh, but I know Linux network stack is highly optimized. Um, and I believe with our um, own multiplexes, we can reduce a lot of the complexity in a network stack as well. So there's space for optimization there. We also want to extend the device driver framework to support other device classes. So we're currently looking into supporting storage devices or block. And then, of course, we want to evaluate a proper multi-core setup, uh, where I believe beating Linux throughput may be more of a challenge. So all the source code is open source. Um, and here are the links again, as well as the links for the device driver framework and the IP bench program we use to measure the system. I'm now ready to open um, for questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we've got about four minutes, four or five minutes for questions. Any questions? Uh, how does it handle uh, user space drivers crashing? I'll bring the mic up. Thanks. Who wants to answer the crash? Uh, how does what handle? Like, do you mean the kernel or the the whole system? Or well, I mean, if if the kernel just won't uh, execute it anymore if it crashes, um, so that component's just not executing anymore. Everything else is fine. Um, if something depends on it, then obviously you got to that component has to handle that. Uh, there is obviously also the ability to restart uh, components. So um, let's say if you have some server that sees a driver has crashed, uh, then you can it could restart it, for example, and try to get it into a working state again. Um, but yeah, the, the thing to stress is that uh, the driver crashing does not take down the rest of the system. Any more questions? What's your development workflow like for developing device drivers? Are you using specific hardware or software? It's largely down to availability, um, particularly of the um, reference manual, because not all hardware is as well documented as other bits of hardware. Um, we are limited to a set, a small set of boards at the moment, but we hope to make ports over the next little bit. Any other questions? I was wondering, I, I, you guys talked a little bit about one use case, uh, which was the man in the middle defense, I think it was called. Yeah, what are... Yeah, what are the other uh, places that you see this being used now or in the future? Uh, yeah, so the core platform's pretty new. Um, it got released uh, into the open uh, about a year ago. Um, and so we're working with a couple of organizations. Um, the VMs that I 
uh, was referencing earlier, uh, we've got a lot of work going on right there, uh, um, there to basically have secure and performant um, uh, VMs and device drivers all interacting with each other. Uh, so I guess the use cases for that are, um, I don't know, maybe drones or IoT devices, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's also a space company that uses SEO4. Um, I don't think they'll be using the SEO4 core platform, at least for now, but yeah. yeah. That's great. Any more questions, or we will wrap up? Uh, thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Yvonne. It's great work. Thanks very much.